Is it on? Yeah. I'll just talk loud. Okay. Um, so I'm here from Argonne National Laboratory. I'm going to talk about uh, the toolkit for advanced optimization. Uh, we work very closely with PETC. Uh, and you need to install PETC before you can install Tau. And using all of uh, PETC's resources, we concentrate on uh, optimization, nonlinear optimization. I'll just give a few examples. We have unconstrained optimization, there's bound constraint optimization, and there's uh, well, general constraint optimization. We don't do this in Tau. We get a lot of questions. How do I solve my problems with constraints? And this is not something we can solve right now. Okay, so a general unconstrained optimization problem. You have a function and you want to find the minimum. We do this very well. Uh, using PETC, we can do this on your laptop. We can do this on uh, Jaguar or Carver. But once uh, somebody has their, their code, they find the minimum, and they realize that, well, uh, temperature can't be less than zero when we told them that that was the minimum. Or we get somebody wants bounds on their, con on their variables. Uh, we, this, is, this is a harder problem. We do this very well, too. Uh, we can we cannot do general constraints, and this is uh, oh, if you add your two variables, it has to be less than seventeen. There are ways to get around this. Uh, C of x is an arbitrary function. And these can be equality constraints, inequality constraints. We, we don't do these. Uh, we do have a special nonlinear least square solver. And this well, if you have a function, you're trying to fit something. Generally, this comes in place if you have some data and you're trying to, you have a model that you work on in your computer and you think this is the way everything should work. And when you run the model, you get, your points aren't quite matching up. So you need to tune your parameters so that they can match up as, as well as possible. Uh, we do solve some PDE constraint problems. I'm, I'm not going to go into this today. If you have questions about this, you can ask me later. And so what I want to talk about is some of the algorithms we use to solve these problems. Uh, so the most, most popular one that people use is Newton's method. We also have quasi-Newton methods. I'll go into detail later. Quasi-Newton methods, conjugate gradient methods. We have a few other methods, a few other solvers. I want to go back. Most of these methods are, are iterative. Well, they're all iterative. You, you, you define a point, and you need to figure out what direction you need to go to get it a better point, and then you search along that direction. And we, Tau has various line searches for finding a, a good point along that direction. And it's going to be just like uh, Petsy when you want to do a different uh, KSP solver or a PC solver. You can uh, go from the command line and, and choose a line search. Give some examples of that later. Uh, 
so Newton's method is the, is the one that many people use. So you have your function, you need to compute your gradient, and you need to compute your Hessian second derivative. And then you have to solve this equation in order to find out what direction you need to go. This is where we use PETC mainly, if we have this equation, KSP solver. And once you get a new, new point, you update to your new point, and then you compute your, your function gradient has seen at the new point. Okay, and there are some, some cases where Newton's method is not good. Uh, big one is you need a second derivative, you need to compute your Hessian, you need to store it, you need to actually do the math to figure it out. Um, and then you have to do a linear solve on this Hessian. Yes, yes, absolutely, yes. So the Yes, yes. It'll be the same way you, you solve it with PETC. You add a preconditioner there. No, what happens is that for my problem, I cannot figure out the Hessian. I can get an approximate Hessian. So uh, it depends on the problem. Usually, an approximate Hessian is good enough. Go ahead. You, you can also uh, do a uh, finite difference uh, application of the, the true Hessian and use your approximate Hessian as a precondition. <laughs> you can um, approximate the Hessian by f of x plus k minus f of x over k, mm -hmm. where k is the vector that you want to evaluate the Hessian in the direction of. And so that's a Jacobian tree in Krylov that Davis is going to talk about. And you can use your approximate Hessian as a precondition of that, which is usually pretty good. And if you can't get the Hessian, uh, we also have quasi-Newton methods where we take all your function and gradient evaluations and we, we come up with a best guess about what your Hessian should be, and we use that. And this is why I'm saying that even if you don't have the exact Hessian, something close enough usually works. Uh, so quasi-Newton methods, we just need the gradients. Uh, we can come up with a, a scheme for BK so that it's easily stored, usually on the order of like five gradients is good enough. We don't, we don't store the whole Messian, store the whole Hessian. And we want, we want to come up with something so that we can solve this easily. We don't want to do a, an iterative linear solve on it. Uh, we have methods where it's just a direct, a direct solve. Okay, and there's uh, conjugate gradient algorithms. Uh, these are similar to what was that? KSPs, but we're doing an iterative, so we're changing. The, the, the formulation each time we go through it. There's just a couple different flavors of, of the updates. Uh, we have, these are all options you can change on the command line if you think one is going to work better for your problem than another. Uh, we find that quasi-Newton methods are much better than the, the conjugate gradient methods for most problems. Uh, yeah, it can be in. Well, it it's. It can be indefinite, but you can um, even have non convergence of non linear CG. It can fail to be true. Linear CG will always converge to a symmetric matrix. Non linear CG can admit an indefinite matrix, but it will not always converge. So sometimes it can fail.
Okay, and then there's some cases where we don't have derivative information at all, so we have, well, these are, we don't have all these algorithms in Tau, but there are different ways to solve it if you don't know any derivatives. One is to do a pattern search, uh, or you just take a sampling of places. Uh, there are other, like, genetic algorithms and simulated annealing, things like that. Uh, what is it? Ant swarm. I think they do. There's also a Nelder Mead simplex. Uh, we have this in Tau. And we have, well, I'm going to talk about model based methods in a minute. Uh, it's also possible to use finite differences to solve your problem if you don't have any gradients. Uh, that's, we really don't recommend that because if you have more than 10 variables and you're doing a step in each direction, and it's, gonna, it's gonna take forever. Okay, so what do we have in Tau? Um, at this point I wanna say that you had a question about PETC where Barry says if you're only doing KSPs then you probably shouldn't be using PETC, but I, I have the opposite opinion. If, if you're doing anything, you should use PETC. Because <laughs> uh, PETC does, this handles a lot of stuff for you. All, portability, you don't have to worry about how to get the command line arguments from Fortran using this compiler. You know, passing strings from C to Fortran. Um, whenever I program without using PETC, I, I, I know that Betsy's already solved this problem, and I'm, I'm wasting my time. Okay, so what does Tau do? So like Petsy, Tau is a library of solvers. We have the Newton methods, quasi-Newton methods, and everything. You can change your solver some of the command line. Uh, we have C, C++, and Fortran. At one point, Lissandro did Python, and we changed everything on them, so I'm pretty sure that doesn't work now. Uh, we can you take your same code, you can solve it on your laptop, you can move it to, to Carver. Should work great. And we use Petsy data structures and utilities. We use Petsy everything. We use their make file system, which I don't know how Barry did that. And some of the solvers. Uh, LMVM is our quasi Newton method, and BLMVM is our bounded version of that quasi Newton method. NLS is a Newton line search. NTR is a Newton trust region. And trust region means instead of doing a line search where we pick a direction and go, we say we think our model using our Hessian, we think our function should be doing this, so we're going to find the minimum in this certain area. And then we take the actual function value at that point and we if it matches our model pretty good, we say we're doing great. If it doesn't, then we, we expand our model a little bit. We find that the uh, line search usually works better than the trust region. This is a, a combination between trust region and line search. Again, usually just the line search works better. Uh, conjugate gradient method. It's our Nelder Mead derivative free, so we don't need any gradient or Hessian. Uh, this is our bounded quasi Newton. Tron is a bounded version of Newton trust region. GPCG is a bounded version of conjugate gradient. And uh, Pounders is our least square solver, it's derivative free. There, we have no global information. We're not going to solve a global problem for you. It's a good question. Can you please move yourself in the other bucket, maybe? 
Ó. Oh. Cell phone. Is Pounders, Nedler, Meat with Pounds? Uh, I'll talk about it in a minute. No. It's, de it's completely different from Nedler, Meat. Okay, these are just some of the examples. Petsy has examples in their directories. We have examples in ours. These are just some of the, the problems we can solve. I, I don't know much about these examples, so please, I'd much rather talk about your problems. And this is a bound example. We just take a, a sheet and we said, artificially, we want everything to be bigger than this made up plate we put under there. Uh, some performance information. This is old data. I was talking to Matt before. Matt, he doesn't think we should use old data for this. Uh, we can solve bigger problems than this now. But just to give an idea of how, how well it scales. Okay, mesh sequencing. I don't want to talk about this because it's not in the, the latest version of Tau. Uh, Petsy changed their, the way they do DMs, and we haven't updated it. So it won't work right now. But when it works, it'll work great. Uh, this is without any mesh sequencing. See, but we're limited on problem size. If we do mesh sequencing, then we can solve bigger problems in, in very little time. Okay, now I'll talk about a little about Pounder because this is new in our, our latest version. Well, 2.1 is new. It's a derivative free. Well, so technically this algorithm, this algorithm is not in Tau, but the next one based on this one is in Tau. That's because we got funding to put the other one in Tau. So uh, I want to compare this to the Nelda Mead algorithm that I mentioned is also in Tau. What it does, I'm for it kind of builds a, a simplex. Yeah, I'm talking about Nelda Mead now. It builds a simplex and it you have function values at each of those points. You don't know any gradient information, so you just kind of, well, so if this is the best one out of these four, then I'm probably going to want to go that way. And so you kind of test out a few function values that way, and you make a new simplex. And now if this one's the best one, well, it can't be the best one. If this one's the best one now, and this one's the worst one, then you kind of move that way away from it. Uh, so that works. It's, it's better than some other uh, derivative-free algorithms, but that, that works pretty slow. Uh, so what Pounders does, well, Pounder, it takes your function values and say, what if this, I want to make a, well, it's not quite quadratic, a, a model based on these points. Say, if I have those points, then I want to fit, fit a surface to those points. And after I fit the surface, I'm going to say, well, this imaginary surface has a minimum here. So then I'm going to go evaluate it at this new point. It's model-based because you, you have a model of what the function should look like, what you think it looks like. And so we extrapolate in on this. We have a nonlinear least square solver using this. And what this does is when you have your sum of squares, each one of these is its own function. Your, your experimental value minus the, your, your model value. So each one of those is a function. And you build a model based on each one of those functions because you have the special information. And this works much better than 
and just minimizing f when you don't use any of the information from each of the, the data points. And when we give some results using this method, we had a nuclear physics problem. And they wanted to find a minimum. And so using Nelder Mead, you know, it took us you know, almost three days to find something using 72 cores. And we, they sent us their problem. We'd, we'd spend, well, three days to solve it after, you know, a day waiting to get our problem solved. And we get back to them and say, well, that's not quite right. We need to change something. And so we'd spend another three days, four days solving a problem. Uh, so when we added this pounders method to it, you can see that we were, we were able to find a, a a better solution much quicker. Okay. So what we don't do, we don't do your modeling. We don't know anything about uh, discretization. We don't know what your, we don't know anything about your problem really, except for the special case in powders where we know it's a sum of squares. Uh, we don't know the derivatives unless you tell us, so we can't figure that out. There are packages that will compute derivatives for you, and if you've never, if you've never heard of Adasi or Adafor, some of these tools that developed at Argon, well, partially at Argon, uh, I, it's worth checking out. And they actually, they take your code and they look at it and say, well, you're doing a sign here, and you're doing adding things here, and then they automatically come up with the, what your gradient should be. Uh, we don't do the linear program. We let Petsy do all the linear programming. Uh, I'm sorry, linear solving. We don't do linear programming where... We do. You do? SNES VI. SNES VI? Okay. I didn't know that. It's not especially uh, great, but it Yeah. It compares to some of the other. <coughs> yeah, that Alan Kahn problem. Yeah, OK. OK. So. OK, well, we don't do that because it has constraints. And we don't do constraints. Uh, we don't do integer programming, where, where some of your variables are integers. And guess about this. We don't do global minimization. We can't come up with any guarantee. <laughs> There's no way to guarantee you have a, a global solution. Uh, some of the, there's some other packages that will come up with a percentage confidence that you have a global minimum. Uh, but we'll, we'll just find a, give it a starting point, we'll, we'll go to a local minimum. So if you want to do this, you can start from, uh, several different places and there are good strategies for starting from different places. You don't want to just pick random places or um, or worse. Yeah. Um, uh, is there a we can read telling us where, where to start again? Because like previously what I've done, I mean I've always just extracted points randomly and then followed the gradient on the bottom and I think the minimum will go to the bottom. Is there but you're there's something smaller to do? Uh there are smarter ways. Yeah. Uh, I think what we use generally is Latin squares, where if you just pick random, you might get, and then you miss quite a bit. Uh, if you do something systematic, like just pick these points, you, there might be something systematic in the problem. and you'd actually catch some kind of a frequency thing. Uh, but if you pick, break it up into, into squares or cubes or hypercubes, and then from those, pick random places in those squares. That would be my suggestion on how to. You want a low discrepancy sequence, basically. You want something. I don't know. There are other, there are other sequences that general 
Okay, I want to go into a little bit on how to program using Tau. Uh, before we do this, I want to show you that we really do use everything from PETC. Go to the Tau web page. I think it looks better up there than on here. There we go. If you go into documentation, we have a user's manual just like Petsy does, and it's probably 100 pages long. If you want to go in depth on how some of the solvers work, you can go there. Just like Petsy, we have example programs, and it looks just like a Petsy page. And the hyperlinks are not working. Okay, well, I will be fixing that soon. Yes, I have some work to do. Uh, but we do have, for every function, uh, we have what it does and what the arguments need to be. And we should have a list of examples that use those functions. And did Bill made all those tools, right? For, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, full screen. Okay. Can everybody see that green? Yeah. Barely. Uh, So when you, when you solve tau, you need first, you need, uh, you need routines. You need to say, this is my function value. This is my gradient uh, at, at, at a given point. Uh, this is the Hessian. And then you also need uh, a driver program. This says, I need a, you need a driver program that you know, creates tau, sets everything up, um, solves your problem, and analyzes the results. And, we use everything from Petsy, we use matrix vectors and KSPs mostly. A uh, little graph on how everything works together. Uh, so Petsy does all the, the linear solvers. Uh, we do the optimization solvers and you need to write uh, everything that's specific to your application. Uh, I think this says the same thing. So you use routines uh, for initial point. I know we talked about what the initial points were here. Uh, you need to decide what to use for your initial points. I say it's optional because you don't really need a function to do it. You can just say this is the initial point. Uh, these are some of the examples that are in the, they're on the web page. They're also in the, the Tau source when you download it. Uh, if you're going to start somewhere, look at these examples first. There's both C and Fortran examples. There's uniprocessor and multiprocessors examples. Uh, you didn't go into any of this on Petsy, did you? On user context, uh, yeah. yeah. It's, it's boring stuff, yeah. So uh, your function evaluation is a, a callback routine. You're going to register it, 
and Tao's going to say, okay, right now I need a, a function evaluation, so it's going to go call your routine. And when it does that, it's going to have your routine might say, but I need more information than just what the point is. I need I need to know what the, the size of the problem is and what some of the parameters are because if you do like Matt said, then the stuff isn't hard coded in. You get it from the command line. So all these should be dynamic things. And so we just wrap this up into a to a C structure, and we pass it around as an extra. We pass it as this this void star, opaque object. Where is the gradient star? Sorry, is my function or just return the object in value? Uh, this. Yeah, this function, you get a vector in, and it returns a, a real value, saying that's the function value at this at this x. So how about if it's a gradient-based method? Yeah, so if you have a gradient-based method, you also need to write a gradient function. And that takes in a, a vector x and returns a vector g. And I don't have it here, but most times when you need a function, you also need the gradient, so there's a combined function gradient routine. I think all the examples use that, where you pass in a vector and you return the function value and the gradient. Uh, and for a Hessian, this is where you pass in a vector, you return your matrix at that point. You also return a preconditioning matrix at that point and some kind of a Betsy flag telling you whether whether your your non zeros changed and things like that. If you do a KSP solver, KSP solve has almost the same not, not KSP, a SNES solve has almost the same uh, functionality. So and then you need uh, a program that Tau is a library, so you, as a Tau application writer, have main. So you need to write your main function. And basically, you're going to create Tau. I'll go over it in more detail a little bit. So, beginning of your function, or beginning of your main, you're going to do. Uh, Petsy initialize, and right after that, Tau initialize. Uh, you could probably skip the Petsy initialize because Tau will realize that it needs Petsy because we're useless without Petsy. Uh, then you create a, a Tau object and you set the type. Even if you set the type here, you can change things on the command line. This is just what, what it starts out as. Uh, and then you create your vector. You create a matrix. Uh, so once you have uh, these objects, you need to set your, your initial vector to something. Then you say, you tell Tau that use these routines that we talked about earlier. And we're going to pass this opaque pointer to it so that your function knows some more parameters. Uh, same thing with the Hessian, but we're actually going to pass in the, the Hessian matrix there. We don't do that on the gradient because we, we copy your function and make a gradient function out of it. We can't do that with the Hessian. Okay, and then we... Uh, Yeah, sorry. Yes.
it's a function pointer. So somewhere you have, you declare this function, and you can just pass in the name of that function. Okay, solve uh, this tile set from options is, is really important because this is the one that goes to the command line and checks all those command line options that you can use. Uh, you can set the different solvers, you can set your line searches. And there are other monitoring and viewing routines that you can set. Uh, and then you solve it and you look at your wonderful solution. And then, because you always made a mistake, you go back and fix what you did wrong. Okay, uh, what I did where was I created uh, unique processor vectors and matrices, but if you want to solve, you probably should create, uh, you should use MPI vectors really. Uh, even if you're doing one processor example, create everything MPI, that way when you go up to to multiprocessor, everything's already set up for you. Okay. Uh, so we can download Tau from this web page. We have the PDF document, uh, man pages for all the routines. We also have some examples. I just wanted to run a few things to show you. Uh, got download, download Tau, go to this page, and you can put anything you want for email. We really don't check. Uh, it gives us a nice idea about how many people are using Tau, and then when the uh, Department of Energy says, how many people are using Tau? We'd like to have a number. Whether or not that number means anything, nobody knows. Uh, we have an open source license. If you want to, you can copy this code and make a new company out of it selling the code. Uh, we probably won't help you out, but you're welcome to do it. Installation instructions, basically, once you have Petsy installed, you set Petsy dir and you set your Tau dir and you make. They're, you don't have to configure Tau separately. Uh, one caveat we have is we do not do any complex arithmetic with Tau. So when you configure Petsy, you have to make sure that you're not doing complex Uh, most of the reason we do that is when we have our bounds, well, a lot of things are meaningless and complex. We're finding minimum values. Uh, is it, no, we no longer need C++ bindings. We are more tightly coupled to Tetsi than ever. And yeah, at, at one point, Tau version one, we used uh, special abstract classes. And then we realized that Petsy's classes are really abstract anyway. So we'll just use them. If you really need a different kind of vector that Petsy does not provide, then you can make your own Petsy vector type. Because Petsy is extensible. That's the E in Petsy.
Okay, so to compile an example, you set, is that too small? Can everybody see that? So just like Petsy, our examples are going to be in source and then the module, which is unconstrained or bound, or at least squares. We have names for our examples, which I like, but it uh, doesn't really matter. If I want to run this, and here I have a, I set it to, to view information about the solver. So when it runs, you can see what type of solver you used, what type of line search you used. Uh, when you do, there's different ways of doing bounds, uh, subsetting the active set gives you <coughs> what tolerances you used to solve it, what your final objective value was, how many evaluations, and gives you a good reason on why it stopped. This is new. We used to just give you a number. Uh, so if you want to change the solver, we can do it at the command line. Type. Uh, John, this is the Newton type method, so it's going to solve it in, in fewer iterations. Like BLMVM, that took 10 iterations. If you want to change the line search type, we can do that on the command line. If you want to say no line search, it doesn't make too much difference in this example. And what day is the default for this. Okay, uh, we can also, let's go back to Tron. This one uses uh, linear solve. All the Petsy options that you can use, we can use here. Obviously, some of them won't work right. Uh, so depending on your, uh, your problem, you want there's a lot of things you can play around with. If you want tighter tolerances, Uh, yes, another thing Petsy does is when you misspell your options, it will tell you that's probably not a real option. You messed up. Okay, we can see that we get a It took longer to converge, and we got a tighter example, a tighter answer. And we'll go through some of these options in the tutorial later. But uh, I think all right, that's all I have to say. Can you talk a bit about the PDE constrained optimization stuff? Um, I can't talk much about it. Uh, Todd, Todd put this in. 
Uh, you can ask me afterwards, and I'll give you Todd's email. Uh, we have, do you want the algorithm or what kind of problems it solves? Yeah. yeah. General okay. Uh, we, there's, we talk about it in the manual if you want to go there and look. It, it, it depends on how many variables you want to control, basically. Whether they do a reduced space method or a full space method. Uh, right now, we just have a reduced space method. Oh, So the lack of handling constrained problems, is that just that the algorithms aren't implemented, or is there some major limitation of the way tau is designed or structured that would um, bend the, that? One, they aren't implemented yet, and two, they're very problem specific. I, I don't know if there's a good way that you could have an, uh, an algorithm that would work for, for, any, for any application. Okay, I'll, um, I'll talk with you offline. Probably. Okay. Okay, uh, this is probably really dumb. Um, so, okay, so so currently I've always done my my, my optimization using using the MATLAB function uh, f min con, right? So, um, I, I, as far as I can tell, everything f min con does, tau does, or is that mistaken? F min, I'm not familiar f -min with. Do they do you constraints? It it, it, I know. You said it doesn't do okay. linear programming stuff. What you have to do is you have to transform your problem yourself to put in slacks for all the linear constraints. Okay. If you do that, you could use the bound constraints in Tau and solve your problem. But it won't by itself accept linear constraints like f min con does. Okay? I think I understood that. Okay. All right. Thank you. So, how many like gradient-based like optimization algorithms like in Tau's collection? How many what? The gradient-based optimization Grid? gradient-based gradient greedy-based yeah algorithms like currently in Tau, so I can try. I'm, oh, gradient-based. I'm sorry. Uh, I had it on a slide. So the ones that don't need a Hessian would be just gradient-based. Uh, and GPCG. But yeah, use BLMVM. That's going to work. That's going to be the best one. Uh, if we have an application where we need a different solver, then we may add another solver. It's extensible, but I, I mean, I'm yeah. not aware of anything that's, that's good that's not there. For example, the BFGS? BFGS is the, okay, that's, so BFGS. This is, this is, this is BFGS. Yes. Oh, BFGS. Yes. <coughs> yes. Quad, the more general term would be quasi so that's a bound constrained limited memory variable metric quasi Oh, moving asymptotes? Yeah, MMA. Okay, no, no, no. Okay. You can, you can, uh, again, that's a, it's a language problem because it's, um, the day, I hate when people make up words for stuff that they don't have to make up words for because it's, it's expressible. Yeah, it's expressible in terms of, of approximating the relation. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm pretty sure, if I understand it right, which I think I do, it's, uh, it's an approximation method which you can always do by giving that approximation. It should be it should be fine to use the LM. Uh, it's just a different approximation. Uh, I mean, we can we can talk about it, but I think that's right. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. So let's start. Uh, Jason.
ਸਕਦੇ ਹਾਂ